Okay, so we'll move forward and I want to invite Professor Mauro Ferrari uh, to chair this panel and I, I, got, I just can tell you one personal thing that if you get his excitement, he can write a project, a winning proposal in one month. Is <laughs> that what we did? Or less, two or three proposals. Thank you, Mira. Okay, terrific. If I can have the slides. So first of all, we are going to be entering the phase where as we just started, we are going to get into conversations and the debate and ideas and constructive thoughts. The objective here is to, of course, give feedback to the extraordinary researchers that have presented today and help shape the vision for what comes next. So, uh, very good. I would like to ask my panelists to come up. I believe those chairs are for them. Is that the way it is? Okay, great. So, Professor Lene Jewel Rasmussen, Managing Director of the Center for Healthy Aging at the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine in Copenhagen, Denmark. Professor Flavia Marinelli from Fermentation Chemistry and Biotechnology at the University of Insubria in Varese, Italy. Professor Ilio Siegel, who vice chairs research information systems at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and at the Department of Diagnostic Radiology and Nuclear Medicine. And Professor Patrick Hunziker, who is deputy head of the Clinic for Intensive Care Medicine at the University Hospital of Basel, Switzerland. I am going to be making some opening remarks. So again, in the spirit of constructive, of course, discourse here, we have seen multiple different models presented in the morning. And uh, here it is where I'm gonna find very quickly that uh, we do have, a, where is it? Left or right? No, 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 I just want to show the, the, the pointer. Center. Pointer, no pointer, it's okay. So, uh, so first, speaking about potential models for development uh, and potential economic growth brought about by this research institute, we have heard the potential that is already taking place for medical and wellness tourism capitalizing on the beneficial properties of the environment here at the Dead Sea. We have seen applications of that to pulmonary, to cardiovascular disorders as well. Of course, in parallel, there is the notion that the research done here can be used for developing potential products to be used in medical practices and exported. It is not an either or, it can be done, of course, both at the same time. Third, the notion of establishing core facilities and core competencies that drive uh, uh, the science, a platform knowledge base that can be used in multiple different fields. We have heard that with respect to the microbiome research and core facility, and also in terms of the expertise on the desert plants for applications in both agricultural and the pharmaceutical industry. And we have seen this, uh, this great work that they are doing at Ahabad that is sensational, where they develop the science and products based on that in a way that is absolutely unique, has got the scientific rigor and the product development as well. So congratulations to all of the speakers for the science and of course congratulations to Ahabad for the business development that comes with that. Now, these are some of the models and some of the platforms that we can think about commenting on as we go on with the rest of the program right here. And maybe I can do it this way, here we go. Now, by way of quick introduction, I am also interested in developing products for medical applications. And I work at Houston Methodist Research Institute. So this is our research institute. I wanna give you a little bit of an idea of who we are, drawing a few of the parallels that exist between this research institute and ours. And the purpose for that is simply to tell you the mistakes that we have made so that perhaps we don't have to do them again, you can make your own mistakes. And if there is anything virtuous that we have developed, perhaps you may think about adopting those as well. So one thing that we have in common is that uh, we just started. Essential Houston Methodist Hospital is one of the leading hospitals in the United States and decided about 10 years ago to start a research identity, built a facility, which in some ways is reflective of this great facility that you built right here, I became, I opened it up, I was recruited as president and CEO. At the time, all the numbers that you see there 
listed the, the, the number was zero. We didn't have any faculty, we didn't have any research protocols, we didn't have a grants office, we didn't have an IRB. We didn't have any of those. And uh, inside of 10 years later, now we have about 2,500 employees, about $200 million of research expenditures per year, more than 1,000 clinical trials, uh, and some of the other numbers that you see right here. Some of the bets that we have made, strategic directions that is, are very similar to what is being contemplated here. I would like to focus on those in my brief initial remarks. We decided, and we here as a broad we, used a Methodist board of directors with the advice of the experts that they were working with, decided to focus on not only developing the breakthrough scientific discoveries, but also bringing them to the clinic as quickly as possible, and as safely as possible, what is known as translational research. As you all know, on average in the United States, from the moment a discovery is made, that for instance will warrant the publication in Nature, or in Science, whichever journal you want, to the moment that same discovery is applied in the clinic, on average it takes 17 years and on average it costs about $3 billion. That is an unethical situation that we have, uh, that as a community, we have painted ourselves in that corner. It's, uh, it's untenable, it's non-sustainable. If you look at the reasons why the situation is what it is, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the places that do discovery, the places that do the breakthrough research, do not have access to translational facilities any core facilities, and in particular, good manufacturing practice facilities. So as a response to that, we have decided, as we started from scratch, as we started from ground zero, we decided to focus on building the right intellectual environment in terms of basic research, but at the same time also avail ourselves of, of state-of-the-art facilities to bring things to the clinic in terms of GMP and others that I will introduce in a moment. So the quick summary of what I just said is that we focused on certain key directions that were fundamental for us, and you will see some of the fields in a moment, uh, around the three basic principles. One, translational. Everything we do is aligned to moving things in the clinic. We are a hospital. We see a million patients per year. So our primary responsibility is to the patients that we serve and to patients worldwide that can actually benefit from the things that we develop. So translational is the key word, and we define translational very tightly. Super disciplinary, because if you're looking for the breakthrough discoveries, chances are that does, they are gonna happen where the tectonic plates come together across multiple disciplines. That's where the new mountains come up. So it's a, it's a value proposition, it's a strategic decision. And so we have departments such as uh, computational surgery. We have departments such as nanomedicine, systems medicine, things that bring together technology, the basic sciences under the same roof with a very clear clinical guidance and clinical bend. And third is transformational. We don't like to do incremental work. So we like to take high risks and focus on the big, big problems. In cancer, we look at metastatic disease. That's what kills people. If it is cardiovascular disease, we look at the primarily, say, the problem of unstable plaque, and you can go through a number of different examples. So those can be, of course, different in different environments, and I'll come back to this in a moment. So the second proposition is key translational infrastructure, the manufacturing side, and we focus on the manufacturing side on those things that uh, uh, harmonize with the three basic principles. So we do the new stuff cell therapies, nanotherapies, uh, radionuclear, there is a reason for that as well without going into details, uh, devices. Again, it's technology and biology together at the service of the patient. And uh, uh, so GLP, the animal studies that we do, we can go all the way to non-human primates and do everything GLP level. Why is it important to be able to do things GLP level? Because you want to present them to the regulatory agency. The scientists that have spent $100,000 to do a piece of research and get a paper in Nature, to do GMP and GLP work to get regulatory approval is going to take $10 million before you get to clinical trials. And that money is not available anywhere, certainly not at the NIH. 
So, and then all of the offices that have to do with running clinical trials, as I said, we have more than 1,000 at this point, and the clinical protocols, and the various interfaces that are necessary with the, with the regulatory agency, with industry, with venture capital, with other partners that are necessary, of course, for this virtuous type of endeavor. And finally, once you have established the infrastructure, then you need money to run it on specific projects. As much as I know that I'm talking to the nation on planet Earth that has made the word startup a word of success, that model, and God bless you for that, sensational, unbelievable. And of course, there were times when the startup model in the United States was also very effective. But if you look at the efficiency of that model now, has plummeted, has dramatically plummeted. Why? Because crossing the valleys of death, of which there are many, for startup companies in the pharma and medical technology world has become harder and harder and harder and harder. So we think it's very good if the products that we develop in-house are incubated in-house longer. We don't put them out before they enter clinical trials. We put them out when they finish phase two clinical trial. Then they are much sturdier and they have a good opportunity to really make it through the various commercialization processes. Not to deny the startup strategy. The startup strategy is good in some occasions, but not in general, at least not in the environment that we live in. So we have created these internal funds that we use for product development in a translational mode, GMP, GLP, phase one, phase two. That's what we define for translation. And we do that with internal funds on products that are identified as the best candidates by external panels. So essentially we use uh, almost like an investment mode of the VC type, but for internal product development. So with that, we have, uh, uh, these are a number of the things that we have done, and I'm not gonna get into any level of detail, but as you see, we have a broad array. This is our campus. The Texas Medical Center is the largest medical center in the United States, I presume perhaps in the world. You see the hospital right there. These are all Methodist buildings, so it's a pretty big little thing, and we are very happy. And by the way, we are very honored that we are partners with Tel Aviv University, and so we look forward to continuing collaborations on those. To speak about multidisciplinarity, you see on the right-hand side that that's what we call NMED, just to give an example, that's a new medical school that we have started, the characteristic of which is that people that come in must have an undergraduate degree in engineering or in computer science. So we can reteach the medical curriculum, assuming that these guys know technology already, which really changes the perspective on how, on the formation of these individuals and their ability to be quantitative problem solvers and a different breed, if you will, of doctors that can supplement, if you will, those that are trained in the traditional way. So having said that, the questions that come up in my mind for, for, for the division of the Research Institute, of course, to some of those we have seen answers already, very clear and wonderfully articulated answers this morning, what are the strategic focus areas? We have seen cardiovascular, we have seen pulmonary, we have seen some of the platforms. Then, of course, the question is always here to find the right people and keep the right people, of which you have many already, great examples. Then uh, uh, key translational infrastructure, if you want to get products to the clinic, you're not, well, not always going to find people like this guy. Uh, that, that, that is a miracle when that happens. You need to figure out a way to find them, bring them, give them the tools. The best way to attract and retain people that can really make a difference this way is to the creation of infrastructure because infrastructure takes so long to develop that you know it's not gonna be a quick proposition to replace it if anybody wants to leave or wants to go someplace else. And the notion of having funds that you can use internally to develop products. And with this, I've told you my perspective on this and I'm delighted to ask my panelists now to come up and we'll be taking turns. And the first is uh, Professor Rasmussen. And after these presentations, then we have about an hour to roll up our sleeves and talk and discuss. Dr. Rasmus.